Hey Raghunath, tell everyone about our Patreon community. Sure, Kostuba. The Wisdom of the Sages Patreon community is an incredible online yoga resource. If you like the type of yoga wisdom and culture we share on the show, then our Patreon community is a great next step. This is a listener-supported podcast, and any level of sponsorship will unlock a wide range of live and archived classes, talks, and even workshops. Raghunath teaches, I teach, and we have a host of other excellent teachers on topics ranging from yoga philosophy, asana classes, storytelling, Ayurveda, kirtan, cooking, meditation, and a lot more. We even have an incredible online bhakti 12-step recovery group. So if you want to check it out, go to patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages. All right, let's get it on. Live from Sham Ashram in Kali, Colombia, this is Wisdom of the Sages, a daily yoga podcast with your host, Raghunath, and co-host and senior educator at the Bhakti Center in New York City, Kostuba Das. Welcome to the show. And welcome to Questions and Answers Saturday. Every Saturday, we start at 8 o'clock and we answer the questions of all the students. We try our best to answer them using uh, the Vedic teachings, what we've known from our, our life living in ashrams and studying studying sacred literature and applying them to the life. And this is part of our growth in spiritual life is a constant ongoing Q&A and trying to sort of like refine our choices. I think it's safe to say one of the goals of yoga is to refine our choices and how we live our life so we can make appropriate choices that assist us to elevate our consciousness um, and grow and evolve. So it's a very big day for me, and I love Q&A day. Tomorrow's special guest day, but it's canceled because I'm in transit heading back to the cold. And um, Rago, do you know uh, what else tomorrow Monday, is? We're going to take off Monday, but usually. Rago? Birthday? Yep. <laughs> no, I don't know. What, what, what is it? Kostuba's birthday. He just said it. What is tomorrow? Yeah. Kostuba's birthday. Oh, we're not having a show on Kostuba's birthday? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I'm so sorry, Kostuba. All right. Oh, we're going to no, celebrate give it. Me a, give, me a, give me a free day. I'll take it. Nine. Oh, all right. We give you the day off. It's Kostuba's birthday. We're both 55. Imagine if not our yet. parents were hanging out pregnant. <laughs> yeah, it's coming. <laughs> They're hanging out pregnant together. So I was a little baby and you were just, you were like in your mom's tummy. Yeah. All right. So when should we celebrate this? Guys? Should uh, we celebrate it? Let's celebrate it Tuesday. I don't know if we it's need to late. celebrate it, but you know. Sound good? Okay. Whatever. Um, okay. Can you guys hear me? I've got a little bit of lag today. A little bit of lag going on. Lag. But it's, it's, it's working. Columbia Internet. Hmm. It's low on their priority list. The waterfalls and tropical fruit are very high on their priority list. Internet good, is sort of like list. down there. I can't hear you guys. You can't hear me? Right. Uh-oh. I don't think you guys can either. Uh, I don't know. All right, we're celebrating a Tuesday. I think that's going to be Wisdom of the Sages. Tuesday is going to be Kostuba's birthday day. So um, before we start... I would just like to share a good little a good little story that Parmananda told me this morning on the ride over here because I was getting in the car to come over to where was, to the ashram and I was singing the questions questions on my mind. So the backstory of that song is uh, there was a disciple of Prabhupada who was um, a, a very fantastic musician, and uh, uh, when he joined the ashram in the old days, everything was very very fanatical. So he was criticized for playing guitar and for writing songs. They were saying, this is all Maya. This music is all Maya. Why are you doing this? And, um, and so he just stopped writing music. And so uh, he recording, he had a Prabhupada, you know, write a lot of songs in English on guitar and, I, and I'm good at it, but you know, all the devotees and the sannyasis are telling me I'm in Maya. I have for doing it, but 
can I play you a song? And, he, and, and Prabhupada said, yes, please. And so we play the song. Prabhupada, oh, I like this very much. And he played him another song. Oh, this is very nice. People will, uh, when people ask Prabhupada why he let him do it, and he says, Prabhupada's answer was, sometimes you have to let a, a, a cow moo. What do you think about that answer? Well, does that mean that he was saying that Mangal Nanda was a cow and you got to let him moo? Or, or he was saying to Mangal Nanda, these people are like cows, they're mooing, just let them moo, but do what you want to do. Which one was it? Um, I don't know. That's up maybe for <laughs> interpretation by great acharyas. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, but maybe we should just let people move. But I just, either I way. Look at it. It's a simple yeah. answer. Let them mm -hmm. move. I felt like people let me move. You know what I mean? Yeah. I felt like you I needed to move in order to move ahead of my spiritual life. It, it, spiritual life doesn't have to be as rigid as we make it. It's expressed through different people, through their different talents and their different proclivities. And sometimes we just got to let them move. Hmm. I think that's where we're going with this. Gotcha. Okay. Um, I'm going to try to switch my internet system because it doesn't, it seems like it's there a has sketchy. been some lagging. Um, okay. I'm going to go on someone's hotspot. Right. Yeah. So anyway, let's dive into our questions. Bro. Okay. Well, th this first question has to do with um, your being allowed to move. You ready? Yeah. Yeah. This is coming from Nick via Facebook. And Facebook is actually not one of the recommended uh, ways to put your questions up. It's not one of the channels that we generally recommend. What channels do we generally recommend, Mara? Uh, email us at wisdomofthesages108 at gmail.com. Or, or if you're on Discord, then you can post it on the Q&A channel. Okay. But this one got through, through Facebook. So we're taking it. Okay. And uh, this one is for Raghunath. It says, Raghunath. Yeah. Can you please explain message of the Bhagavat? Now, message uh, of the Bhagavat is one of Raghunath's songs from Shelter, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, it was the song probably from our biggest record, our mantra record. Okay. If you don't know, I was in a band and we had uh, songs and we had Krishna conscious <laughs> lyrics. We were allowed to move. Yeah, they let. Uh, uh, I was I was encouraged to move actually. Okay. All right. Um, so yeah, well, let, so let me just finish the question. He says, Raghunath, okay. can you please explain message of the Bhagavad? The whole album is amazing, but that song is beautiful in so many ways, and I'm sure means different things to different people. What does it mean to you? Well, good question. I will say, I, uh, I thought it was a little self-explanatory. Parmanand is sitting right here. I thought it was pretty self-explanatory, but I'm, I'll share it. I'll share the words with you. Concealed, revealed, a revolution, a solution without bloodshed. Finally. Slow, so slow, slow it down. Slow down it's right. going too fast for me. Concealed, right. revealed. Okay. What does that mean? Concealed? Okay. Good questions. Why, why is it concealed? Because all these, the, the teachings of, uh, of the sages were all sort of locked in code in Sanskrit. Okay. And then it was revealed. Uh, and it, it was, re how was it revealed? Disciplic succession placed in my possession. Okay. So disciplic succession means it's been carried down from guru to disciple. And then uh, my guru's guru translated it. He translated those secret codes into a language that I understand. And truthfully, I couldn't even understand it. If you try reading the Bhagavad Gita, the Shema Bhagavatam, it's very difficult to understand sometimes. So another devotee or other devotees who sort of like speak in a language I can speak, we give it, they gave it in their language. It wasn't so lofty, they made it practical and relevant. So disciplic succession placed in my possession, complete, so sweet, a satisfying taste for my empty race. You see, there's a fire in the city, a fool won't admit it. And only a fool will sit right in it. Truth has been spoken for all mankind. And if you search for peace, then you can find. The blind will stay blind if they're inclined, but the wise will apply in this crucial time, right? When we hear truth, we don't just want to hear it. We want to apply it or else it'll never be realized truth. Hmm. In illusion and confusion, our world's greatest brains create more problems, not solutions. You know, in the, <laughs> it's unbelievable, huh? It, we, we think that it's great to have great intelligence. Wrong. If intelligence can be easily misplaced. 
And in the way, in, in the name of sometimes trying to s solve a problem, we create more problems. And so um, we need spiritual intelligence. Expand our bold stand. There can be hope for modern man. All our answers to both our spiritual and material problems are found in the Bhagavatam. I'm truly convinced. History of this next person. History of the universe. Now you might say, what? It is. It's a history of the universe. This is true about the history of the universe. 18,000 verses for our edification, like our purification. What did I do? I sat like an ass in class for 14 years. At last, I got some real education. Hmm. I was just writing yesterday. You know, I'm writing a memoir right now. And uh, I read it on Sweet Baby Krishna. If you're a member of Sweet Baby Krishna, or I mean a member of Patreon, you can hear the readings from my book. I, it was the last Sweet Baby Krishna episode we did. It was all readings from my book. Um, but I was, I, I was reflecting in my, in my writing how like, what did I actually learn in school? I learned how to be a, a, a dirt bag, I think. That was like my biggest takeaway from school. I learned how to be, I was a liar. I was a cheater. I, uh, I was a womanizer. I was like, I was like, I, I did nothing to develop my character. I just learned some techniques of how to type and how to do some mathematical problems. And it's like when I first went to India and saw the children learning the Puranas and learning Sanskrit and learning Kirtan, I was like, I want a do over. I want a do over. I want to, I want to like undo like how we, on our computer, we put like command Z. I want a command Z junior high school. I want a command Z high school. I want a command Z that particular, you know, dating thing I did in high school. I want to come I want a command Z. And I was like, don't worry. This is what reincarnation is all about. Command Z. Like we get to do it all over in a different body and a different family. <sighs> so anyway, I sat like an ass in class for 14 years. At last, I got some real education extinguishing the fire of our workaday life that burns and burns us until we break. Material world is like a fire. It's like a forest fire. Workaday life, consuming the mundane with mundane conversations. It's like a forest fire consuming us. Illuminating, it's illuminating, rejuvenating, not degenerating, and gives shelter to the people who want truth. Because truth has been spoken for all of mankind, and it's a sad, mad world when you can find, uh, when you can find man confined to the grind, and they don't even mind to be working for some jerk and leave their life behind. In illusion, in confusion, and don't think there won't be any retribution. Expand our bold stand. There can be hope for a modern man. So uh, the question is, what does it mean? The message of the Bhagavatam is about this book, about this message of truth. And it comes through either literature or through people. And we embrace that message and we apply that message. And to the degree that we can apply it, life becomes sweeter. We start to apply truth into our life and it, escape, it assists us to escape the sinkholes of material existence, the black ice that has us spinning out of control of material existence. And so that's what I did in the form of lyrics. Thank you for the encouragement. That's How was that? Uh, you know, that's, answer, that was great. I think it ought to be our theme song. Maybe that's what we got to play at the end of the show. Maybe that or... should be our theme song. And you know what? Let the cow <laughs> moo. Let me just <laughs> moo, man. That's what I'm saying. Or maybe at the beginning of the <sighs> show or something like that, you know, a little message of the Bhagavad. It's a little loud for breakfast. You know, okay. we'll say <laughs> I like to keep it for the afternoon and late evening. Uh, right. Can I ask you a question, sir? This is from Nathan Dunday. All right. He's from Israel. He's a he's a Zoomer. He's, he's a Zoomer. A, he's here yeah. today. He's here today. Okay. Um, for Kastuba. Why Kastuba? Right. The last one was for you. This one's for me. OK, yeah, you're right. OK, <laughs> I shouldn't take offense. Uh, Shalom Kastuba, I've joined your community after Joe Rogan, and since Bakta, I'm going to start calling him Bakta Joe, Bakta Joe Rogan, because he sends so many people here, even at this retreat here, so many people, raise your hand if you're from Joe Rogan, we got a posse from Joe Rogan here. Amazing. Unbelievable. <laughs> um, 
Shalom, I've joined your community after Joe Rogan. And since the end of February, I've been listening to the show on a semi-regular basis as an other. A little before New Year's, I've made the decision to catch up on all the episodes I was behind on and log on more on Zoom. By the way, if you want to get on Zoom, you email Mara, wisdom of the sages, 108 at gmail.com, and she'll give you the secret codes to join the to join our um our little club. Happy to say it makes me feel wonderful and more enlivened than ever. My question is for Kastuba and more on the esoteric side, because we know Raghunath is quite dull. What is the highest being? I'm just kidding, let me say that. What is the highest being one can reincarnate as? And what kind of life should one lead in order to gain the privilege? I have a faint memory about both, uh, but both of you mentioning Brahma, but could it, it could be I'm wrong. Elaborate as much or as little as you want as, as an ending note. I'd like to thank you and Raghunath from the bottom of my heart. You've been both permanently changed the trajectory of my life for the better. I feel like Ekalavya training archery in the forest with you guys serving as my mud statues of Drona. <laughs> you got to know that story to fully appreciate it. But it's a, it's a compliment calling us mud in that case. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so yeah, so there's two questions. What is the like the highest thing that you can reincarnate as? Highest form you could reincarnate as? And then the second question is, what kind of life should one lead in order to gain that privilege? And he mentions Brahma. And, and, and so, you know, let's, um, let's kind of zoom out a little bit here and, and talk about what the Bhagavatam is presenting. Um, Bhagavatam is presenting that, um, that this world that we're moving around in is a facsimile or a virtual kind of manifestation. It's a reflection. It's a shadow. Many different, you know, kind of metaphors are used, right? But that it, it, in one sense, it's, it's, let's say, reflection of another realm. Um, this is in, the, you could call this the material world that we're moving through. And as we move through this world, we're meant to come to the realization that the things of this world, the material things, the temporary things, are not what give me true, deep satisfaction. Um, that that's only found uh, spiritually, that my nature is satisfied my nature is blissful my nature is happy my nature my nature is to be full of knowledge and understanding and clarity but i've lost touch with that and um but within this realm within this you know and again it's a reflection of another realm but within this realm there's all different kind of positions one can take and a and there's a law that's that's working in this realm it's called the law of karma and that means according to the decisions that you make and how you behave and, and how that molds your consciousness, how that molds your awareness, you, you take on your next form. And you do that again and again and again until you learn the lessons that you're meant to learn, right? Until you get back to the, to the understanding that what am I doing here? Why am I trying to enjoy myself separate from, from God? Why am I trying to enjoy myself separate from, my, from the very root of my existence, like a leaf on a tree? If the leaf says, let me separate from the tree, I'll be happy then, I'll be free. It's like, no, 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 actually your, your freedom and your happiness and your nourishment and your health and, and all that is when you're in connection to, your, to the root. You got to get reconnected. So, so in a sense, it's like this world is an opportunity for us to kind of play with being independent, but hopefully to learn the lessons of, of reconnection, of spiritual reconnection. So now all that being said, as we move through this realm, there are different roles we can take. There are different species we can take. We can be that the, the soul is eternal. It can be in a human body, and then it can move on into a plant body, and it can move into an animal body, and it can travel through all these different bodies. And the bodies are made according to our consciousness, right? We 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 according to our karma, we take on the next body. So now within this entire universe, what would be the highest, you know? form that one could take what would be the highest post or highest position and we could say that it's brahma now brahma is described in the bhagavatam as the creator of the universe he's not the original creator but he's the one that takes all the raw ingredients and begins to shape it and begins to create the different species and the different planets and, and everything and he's considered to be like the most intelligent engineer of the universe and as you hear about brahma throughout the bhagavatam you see he's often like the voice of reason when others are lost in fear and confusion, even when the devas, the, the, the higher planetary beings, 
you know, even when they're confused and lost and, uh, you know, uh, in danger and fear, they go to Brahma and Brahma is like the wisest person. And, and he's just kind of like sets everybody straight. And even the people in very high positions see him as very, very high. So we can say Brahma is like, you could say the most intelligent being in this universe. And then there's another character that comes in the Bhagavatam a lot. His name is Indra. And Indra is seen as like the king of, of the heavens. He's like, you could say he's the most successful materialist when it comes to power, beauty, wealth, sex, fame, all of this. He's accumulated such good karma that he's in like practically the highest position in this universe in terms of material enjoyment. But what the Bhagavatam is saying is that, and it, it, even the Bhagavad Gita, you know, will say that these positions, they're real, they're posts, they exist, but they're not the goal, actually. You know, the, 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 you know because like Bhagavad Gita will say in text um, 8.6, Abrahma Bhuvana Loka, Punar Arvartanojuna, Mamu Peti Tu Kaunteya, Punar Janma Navijite. A Brahma Bhuvana Loka means you can go all the way to Brahma's planet. You can go up to that highest, highest, you know, kind of the highest position. Um, but Punar Arvartan Arjuna, but you still have to come back down because karma is temporary and it's like a bank account. Once you spend all that good karma, it's spent and you come back down to the earthly plane. But Krishna says, Mam Upetya Tu Kaunteya, but one who connects with me, Upetya, one who reconnects, you know, comes in contact with me. Punar Janma Navijite, they don't take birth again. So really, it's not that we're trying to reach these higher levels. And, and re, you know, quite frankly, it's impossible for us to even estimate how many souls there are in this world. You know, it's like, it's in, we don't have numbers that go that high. And only one of them becomes Brahma. And only one of them becomes Indra. You know, uh, we're not concerned with that. Th now, this takes me to the next part of the question. He says, what kind of life should one lead in order to gain that privilege? Now, really, what the highest role, it's not the, it's not, the highest position is not that of Brahma. It's not that of Indra or any of the gods and goddesses in this universe. The highest position is really just to rediscover who we are. And that is a pure jiva, a pure spirit soul in connection with God. That is what this life is meant to take us to. Because, and the Bhagavatam will show us that even Brahma gets in trouble. Even Indra gets in trouble. But it's Krishna's pure devotees. They're, they're always feeling that connection with him, that they can pass through any circumstance. And so that's what we want to uncover. Now, what kind of life should one lead in order to gain that privilege? Well, this we can learn from Brahma himself. And again, that's, that's how the Bhagavatam plays that. It'll show that although Indra's in such an exalted position, he's in fear, he makes mistakes, he does dumb things, he becomes confused, he becomes embarrassed. And the same thing happened even to Brahma. Right, where he saw, and this comes in the 10th canto of the Bhagavatam, Brahma sees that, that, um, that he, he, he kind of misjudges Krishna. Who's this little boy? He's getting all this attention and, and, and so on. Let me kind of show him what's what. And he tries to pull a, I'm not going to tell the whole story now, but he tries to pull a trick on Krishna. And what happens is Krishna just kind of like transcends the entire thing and blows Brahma's mind. And when Brahma sees that, he says, this is no ordinary boy. I've become confused. And out of humility, he bows down to Krishna, and then he begins to offer prayers. And those prayers of Brahma is in the 10th canto of the Bhagavatam, chapter 14. They are just completely saturated with wisdom. They're just beautiful poetry that's just full of insights into life, you know, because it's come from the most intelligent person in the universe. You got one? got one what you got one for us that yeah i'm gonna yeah i'm gonna tell you one of those verses right now it's a famous verse in this one you know because he said because um nathan said said what what kind of life should one lead in order to gain that privilege so much of it is condensed right in this verse here's the first line tate nukam pum susamikshamano right he says um well, I'll, I'll read the whole verse uh bunjana e vatmakritam vipakam Ridvag vapu beer, vididhan namaste, jiveta yo mukti pade sadayabak. That when um, he says that one who goes through all the difficulties in life, right, 
uh, seeing it as anukampam, seeing it as my compassion, and earnestly hoping, just earnestly hoping to get my compassion, right? Krishna, uh, he's saying this to Krishna, that one who goes, one who passes through all the difficulties in life, not complaining about them, not bitching about them, right? Just, just saying like, you know what? Due to the way I've lived and the choices I've made, these, these um, reversals in life, these difficulties in life come my way, but ultimately it's, it's there to help me understand what is what, you know? So I, and, and all I want is, is the blessings of the great souls and the blessings of God that I can actually recover my true nature. One who thinks like that, you know, it says, you know, uh, just enduring, you know, the results of my own bad karma. I'll take it. You know, I, I, I earned whatever troubles I get in life. That's on me. It's not on anybody else. That's on me. Right. And then he says, and this third line is really good. Rid vag vapur beer. Vididan namaste. We all know namaste, right? Like, I'm offering you my respects. You know, real true from the heart, I offer you respect. You know, so hrid means the heart, or you could say the mind. Vak means the words, and vapu means the body. So hrid vag vapu beer vididan namaste. And who with their mind, with their words, and with their body, vididan, they make it all an offering. Right? They say, I'm not living for selfishness. I'm not using my body, mind, and words to kind of try to squeeze whatever material enjoyment out of life I can find. My body, my mind, my words are all meant to be offered in the mood of namaste. Right? I offer you my respect. Osteba, we quote this verse a lot on, on the yeah. show. I think this, here's a makeover Monday. For everybody who wants to do their makeover Monday, say this verse every day. Say it first. Say it. When you wake up, say this first every day. It's a great makeover Monday. A lot of every Monday we take these uh, little commitments. This week I'm going to do this, and okay. so maybe you can sit, put that up on the board. And uh, can you please read it one more time? And maybe yeah. everybody. Well, and let me read the last line too, because the last line really answers the question. He says, "Jiveta yo mukti pade sadaya bak." That mukti pade for the for the mukti pade means. The position of, of being liberated, of being free, that's, the, that's, you know, goes to the question, you know, what's the highest incarnation? It just means to be free, to not be stuck in a material body, in a material situation. And so, mukti pade sadayabak, that that person, dayabak, it becomes their rightful claim. It, they, they, they've earned it. And, that's, and so, the formula is given is, you know, difficult things are going to happen to you in life. Tolerate them. Don't blame anybody else. See them as the results of your own karma. And, and just humbly, you know, patiently um, endeavor for the mercy of God and the great souls. Um, and meanwhile, take your body, your mind, and words and make them all an offering in the mood of namaste. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, that mukti pade, that, that liberation, sadhayabak, it becomes your rightful claim. It's like when your parents die and you inherit their property, you inherit that. It, nobody can take it away from you. It's yours. So that's, um, I think that's a 10, 14, text 8. Um, so beautiful. In, in Shiva Bhagavatam. So can you say the whole English again, Prabhu? Uh, I don't have it right here. I can just kind of, maybe uh, if Mary wants to pull it up or I could pull it up. I'll, I'll pull it up. Just take me a second. Here it is. Got it? My dear Lord, one who earnestly waits for you to bestow your causeless mercy upon him, all the while patiently suffering the reactions of the past misdeeds and, offer, uh, um, and offering you respectful obeisances with his heart, um, w with his heart, words, and body, is surely eligible for liberation, for it has become his rightful claim. Mm. And when you read that whole chapter, and in the chapter or two building up to it, you know, Brahma, the most intelligent being in the universe, has now been humbled. His tears are coming from his eyes. Beautiful Krishna standing there with a lump of yogurt in his hand, right? like a sweet in his left hand. And he's just like, and Brahma is just like, oh, there's a beautiful painting of it. And Brahma is just like, he's really, you know, he's not only super intelligent, but now he's super humble. And, and the words that are coming from his mouth are just like the most... The most valuable messages it's it, it's you know just throw away all the garbage that we're listening to all day and get caught up in media and, and all this stuff and hear this you know hear brahma speak and you're getting it, you know it goes right back to your um 
your song, right? Like this message right here. Is gonna, it's a cure, it's a pan, what's, how do you say the word, Panacea? Mara? Panacea? Yeah, Panacea. Panache? I always call it like a, <laughs> it's a Panache. It's like, um, what's that? What's that? It's Panera Bread Company. What is that? It's a panache. It's a panacea. It's a cure all for all that ails you. The it's message of the Bhagavad, you take it right in the heart. We're trying our best to try to like solve world problems by like in other ways. It's like cutting off Ravana's head. They keep popping up again. Mm. But you take that message of Lord Ram right in the heart. Boom. It changes you. And, and it, it heals both material and spiritual problems. You know, Kostuba, you got onto this point and you made a great point. We don't want to take birth again. Yeah. We don't want to take birth in some even some higher planet. And that brings us to the Netflix series Surviving Death, <laughs> <laughs> which we all watched last night. And I tell you, Kostuba, and it was really good to watch with the whole crew we have here. Okay. We we put it up and we we put it up on the on the wall. If you haven't seen it, just we'll see it. Especially episode six. It's episode six. It's one of these things like, listen, no, it's six, six, episode six. It, what's it called? Reincarnation. reincarnation. Anyway, um, it's one thing. I speak about reincarnation all the time. You know that. We read about reincarnation. We fully opt in that we believe in reincarnation. But it's not until you see episode six, you're like, it's all real. It's <laughs> all real. They got this little child just going, okay. The, the child said, the child said, um, mom, I miss going to the park. I, she, the child said, I miss going to the park with my mom. She goes, oh, you mean when I take you to the park? And the child just goes, no, my other oh, mom. My mom. <laughs> my, my other mom with the pretty hair. And she's like, what do you mean? And then he starts, the mother, mother started digging in. And this child's memory was so clear. She said, what's your, well, what's your name with your other mom? And he gave her a name. And then the child goes, but I was killed. And it was just sort of like, ugh. And then she Google searched the name and found the name of the parents and the kid's name. And I tell you, it is so like creepy, scary, real that you're like, I totally get. But at the end of the episode, everyone's like, yes, yes. I think everybody on the show needs to watch this episode. All Even right. if you don't watch the whole series, episode six. Okay, Robert, we got the message. You like you episode message? six. Right. It's important, it's episode six. <laughs> okay. Um, I get 10% of all this from Netflix. I, go, I worked out a deal with them. <laughs> okay, you ready for your next question? Yes, sir. Hit me. It's coming from Cherry, regular Zoomer. Cherry. Yeah. Cherry she yeah. says, you have touched upon cultural appropriation a few times recently. But I have a more specific question. You ready? Yeah. Is it cultural appropriation for Westerner to wear Indian clothing? I know you both do. So I thought you might have some good insights on this. I spent five months in India. I ended up befriending this Indian guy and his parents in Chennai. And I stayed with them for several times over the course of my trips. My friend ended up flying over to the States for my wedding. We're still friends. While I was there... His mother ended up giving me one of her saris and showed me how to nice. put it on. And my friend took me to lots, lots of places at her urging to go shopping. I came back to the States with another sari and lots of kurtas and shawls and Indian attire. Since then, I've worn kurtas, the shawls, jewelry, blouses, etc. to work and around and about. I'm hopeless at tying the sari, though I have tried. It's Any advice tricky, on it's this? It's a tricky one. <laughs> if it's indeed yeah. okay. Yeah. I still have struggling. I, I've been in this game for about 30 plus years and I still struggle tying that doty. Okay. She says, but I've wondered, is it cultural appropriation for me to wear this clothing out to work, to parties, to family gatherings, etc.? I love the clothing and have received compliments. I was gifted it, it by my friend's family and brought it with the blessings of my Indian friend. But is it okay because I'm not Indian? I recently heard an Indian American yoga teacher define cultural appropriation as when a white person wears, does something from another culture and people like when the white person does it, but when the person of color or another culture does it and it's from their own culture, they get mocked or attacked for it. Thanks so much for your insight and thank you for everything you do. I so appreciate it. Um, I'm going to come right out of the gate saying you can wear whatever you want in this world. How about that? Right? We can wear whatever we want to wear. Why are, we, why are people minding everybody else's business? 
can't we just mind our own business? Now, I understand you don't want people to be exploitate, exploitative, exploitative, exploitative. exploitative <laughs> Mara, help. <laughs> help, Mara. Um, I think a lot is the intention. It sounds like Cherry's intention is she appreciates beautiful fabric. She appreciates the, the loving gesture that it was given to her. She's not walking around and mocking a culture. Um, and I think when it comes to yoga, I, I think people who mock other people's culture, that's a problem. Of course, if we think less of a person because they're from another culture, I think that's a problem. Um, but to appreciate another culture, that's wonderful. I think that's wonderful. I think cultural appropriation, here's what Wikipedia says, is the adoption of an element or elements of one culture or identity by members of another culture or identity, which basically means everybody did that since there's been European or, or, or explorers from all over the world. You know, we take, I, I eat Italian food. Is that cultural appropriation? Mara cooks Italian food. Is that, that's cultural appropriation according to the very definition. But um, that intention behind it, if it's to appreciate is, is quite different. Nowadays, people have taken it to this next level of like, you can't say namaste. If you say namaste, this is ridiculous. You're taking from that culture. I was like, give me a break. I'm a yoga teacher. I can use Sanskrit. I can call down dog a Sanskrit. Word. I'm a yoga teacher, damn it. Let me teach yoga. It's from another culture with other language. I'm not teaching movement. I'm not teaching stretching. I'm teaching the culture of yoga. Must I translate it? And what is my culture anyway? I'm like a mutt. I'm like Italian. I'm a New Yorker. What is my culture? And what is my culture's clothes? Do I dress like an Italian guy? And from what century? Like a Roman? Do I dress like a Roman? Or do I dress like a New Yorker from the 1930s? Because my grandparents lived in the 30s. Like where does it, it brings us to this original question, which is who the hell am I? Who am I? Am I this skin? Am I this flesh? Am I even white, right? Or am I a spirit soul? Now we say it's a spirit soul and the culture of yoga teaches this. Matter of fact, it's very liberating this message of the Bhagavad and it will answer this question. Sometimes people don't wanna answer the question and fix things. Sometimes people just wanna be right and they want to show you how intelligent they are. So I'd be really careful about why people are minding other people's business if it's really to help the world or it's just to make a statement um it's good to want to help the world but truthfully i start realizing the best way i can help the world is to help myself is to really take care of myself um and my own issues and put the moral microscope on me and my own intentions and stop wa worrying about shana's intentions and damodar priya's intentions and stuff like that I think it's great to wear that sari. I think it's a real, um, uh, uh, I think it's a real beautiful thing. What we really have to uproot is this thing where we, we think we're much better than other people and our culture is much superior than other cultures. But the yoga culture itself is a culture of, we are not a body, we are not from any particular culture and it's the original culture of the soul. Sanskrit's not even Indian. Sanskrit is this Devanagari. It comes from the spiritual realm, according to the culture itself. Does India own the spiritual realm? I'm not, I'm not making that up. That's what they say. It's not yours. They say we're not this body. And the great masters of yoga said, you're supposed to give this to everybody and teach this ultimate thing that actually there is no one. There's, there will always be different cultures and that should be celebrated. That's why I like Thai food or Indian food or Japanese food. That's a beautiful thing. We shouldn't try to homogenize all cultures. Uh, we can appreciate them and we will have favorites also. And we will, we will have facets of culture that I move away from and that's okay too. But th the culture of yoga is a culture of liberation. And it's a culture of deep con spiritual connection. And I don't think it's, um, and I think we should really zone in the attention. Just because I'm a white male doesn't make me evil to say namaste. And in the same way, you could be a white male and be evil, but it's got nothing to do with my skin color that makes me evil. It's got, it's, it's got something to do with my individual actions in this world. 
In the same way, just because a person has a darker skin color and is from South India or Northern India doesn't make, make them a spiritual person. It doesn't make them an evil person. It's the actions according to, of that person that makes them evil or not evil or great or wonderful. And I think we have to take this to an individual level as well. Um, and uh, what do you think? Anything where I'm going with this, Kostum? You know, in general, I agree. <laughs> I'm glad you got that off your chest. <laughs> Okay. You know, I do, th I do think there is a, th um, in other words, if I'm understanding what you're saying, is that as long as you're the culture, there's nothing wrong with cultural exchange, um, but it should be done respectfully, right? Sure. And, and and where does it become disrespectful? Sometimes it'll become disrespectful if you take something that's sacred to certain people, and you use it in a way that's um, insensitive to that. Or, you know, the, there you that's, go. You, you know, that's what a nice way to put it. Yeah. Like, so what's a good example? Uh, well, an example for that. Well, look at how people deal with yoga, right? Like you were saying, you know, I'm a yoga teacher. Some people would say that you shouldn't be teaching yoga. Some people say that it's a cultural appropriation for you to teach yoga. Um, now, if you and go so to everybody, yoga, every every person not from China who's teaching acupuncture should give up their license right now. But, well, in any case, so, so um, come on. But s some people, some Western people teach yoga. Uh, with great respect for it, they 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 take the time, they put in the effort to really learn it and understand it, and with intention of um, helping people, they teach it. And other Western people take it and they say, "Hey, you know, they don't spend the time with it, they don't um, respect it uh, the way the way that the original culture does. They use it to make money. They and they present it in ways that um, are very different." And I would say um, cheapen, you know, cheapen it in a sense. And I would call that cultural appropriation, right? It's cultural appropriation. You take one facet of it you like and mix it with your own theories, with your politics, with your, um, uh, you know, your, your spin on life, or if you want to secularize it or kick out spirit. The whole, the whole yoga tradition is a spiritual tradition. And a lot of times you want to just secularize it and kick God out of the party, even though it's yeah. God's party. So, so now, that being said, there are Indian people that are some of the worst examples of like really taking yoga and misusing it, you know, taking it far from its original tradition and really cheapening it in, in you know, in, in terrible ways, becoming the worst examples of it, you know, so. Well, now I'll play devil, devil's advocate because they say, well, this can be controversial with members of a dominant culture because they'll say, well, you're a dominant culture. It doesn't matter. Indians can do that because they're not the dominant culture. They're a disadvantaged minority. But then that also brings up another point. Why are they not dominant? Because they're not dominant maybe financially in a first world market or something like that. Why is money or currency or you know the only uh, metric of what dominance is? I think they have like a spiritual depth that we're completely missing. It will, okay, I'm not. I just sure brought up a would. devil's advocate and I argued myself out. <laughs> okay, and now you back back to you, sir. Well, so so my point is is this: I um I can appreciate some of the concern about cultural appropriation, but what I don't necessarily appreciate is the way that people apply it all the time, and um or, or how I I would say they misapply it. Now I've yoga is something that I've been in, into since I was you know in my late teens. It's oh, something the, that I've. Uh, yeah, something that I've studied, something that I've really tried to understand. And when I look at it, uh, you know, from great teachers, teachers from India and teachers that weren't from India, both. But when I actually go to those texts, you know, and, and, and the teachings of those texts have been kind of illuminated by these teachers, I can see that the yoga culture itself is saying that every living being has a right to this. And it, and it even calls upon us and even prophesizes that it should spread throughout the entire earth. Mm. So if you're going to come to me and tell me that it's cultural appropriation for me to teach it or even to practice it, I'm going to say, well, what you're saying is exactly contradictory to what the yoga tradition says. So you've created a new set of rules, but I'm going to go back to the old rules. Yeah, you know, why do we follow culture. your rules anyway? I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to honor, I'm going to honor that tradition by actually listening to what it says rather right. than imposing some kind of new rules on top of it, you know? And, w and quite frankly, when it comes to clothes, it's like kurtas. Is that even an Indian thing? 
you know, it's, it's like, what are they actually, you know, people all over the world have worn different kind of clothes and things like that. So Romans wore, you, you, everybody wore robes before you think everybody wore jeans, everybody wore robes. So, so in any case, I, I think really what it comes down to is you, people are even good, well-intentioned people, I think, or we're so polarized now that even well-intentioned people are sometimes accusing and pointing the finger and trying to, you know, I, I'm not going to get all worked up about it. I will. I will for you. You're so even keeled. <laughs> it makes me that. sick. <laughs> I know you're a little worked up on this, but, but my point is this, let's be respectful to, to other cultures. Let's try to understand what's sacred to them. Be sensitive to that. You know, like people say like the Indian headdress, right? Like the, you know, native American headdress. Yeah. You know, like that means something to that culture who would wear it, when they would wear it, why they would wear it. And if someone just like throws that thing on and it's just that stupid in it for the people that that culture is sacred to, it's it's um it's offensive, you know, and, and so I get that, you know, I, I get that. Just like if someone took something sacred from the tradition that I identify with, like the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition, let's say the tea lock that you wear on your face, right? Yeah. And they did try to, to do something sexy or stupid, you know, like that. They put out some video and they're everybody's wearing it and they're doing some ridiculous stuff and they're you know whatever. I'm just like, why you know why are you taking that symbol that's sacred to me, having no appreciation for it and and trying to. You know, so th that that kind of thing I think is tasteless, um, and I think we should be aware of that. You know, aware of that. Sure. But um, but the yoga, you know, it, it I mean, you don't think it's funny, Kostuba, if it's Halloween and somebody dresses up like a Harry Krishna guy? I think that's funny. I think we've lost our lightheartedness in this world, and we're and, and in the name of sort of like well, this rigid calling out the. I get it. I get it. We shouldn't mock them. But on something like Halloween, that's that's like a big thing now too. Halloween, you can't be, you can't wear a sombrero. What do you think about that? <laughs> sombrero on Halloween? Can we wear sombreros? Are we are we mocking a cult? What do you think? Don't wear well, the sombrero. I, I, I says, I, I, don't I, wear I, the sombrero. I saw that. I, I, you know, my point is, let's just be respectful of each other, okay. and uh, and All let's right. try not to be too judgmental of each other. You know, and and wear your sari. You know, my wife can help you put it on, Cherry, if you need help. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. All I got a question. Oh, no, no, you got a question for me. No, now. So I got a question for you, sir. What's the question we got? Oh, they're from Kevin Shanahan. Is that the one? Sorry about that. All right. This is from Kevin Shanahan. 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 Kevin Shanahan. Let me first say how grateful I am for you two. That was nice. And of course, oh. Mara for putting this class together. I'm so grateful for the time and effort you take to teach us so much. Before COVID, I was going to my local temple and just popping in every now and then, and I got a couple of books. Then COVID came and everything shut down and I was out of work and really had nothing to do with my days. I believe this was Krishna's mercy. Great way to look at it. Because I was able to devote at least three months of my time to nothing but chanting Japa, reading texts, um, listening to lectures, and of course, listening and watching to your class. Now a lot is opened back up and I'm attending Mangalartik at the temple's morning program every week. That's like an early morning ritual. It's like at 4.30 or five in the morning. I feel like uh, ISKCON, that's the Prabhupada's uh, institution, has brought something valuable into my life. It's given me such an amazing outlook on the world that it never had before. And I'm so grateful for that. However, I've noticed different teachers and different devotees have somewhat a, a different approach to the principles of bhakti. Some are very stern and orthodox, while others are a little bit more relaxed in their approach. Have the added Rugu, we're getting to, major uh, we're getting major lag. I've been brought up into so much Maya ISKCON or the institution. I love Krishna with all my heart and I chant 16 rounds every day and I start my day with Japa and the Bhagavatam class. I don't eat meat, I fast on a codice, I even perform simple RT once a week. However, I live with my girlfriend who I love dearly, and we aren't married and we do have sex. <laughs> Just thought I'd share that with you all. <laughs> Thousands of listeners. Um, and, okay. She doesn't practice bhakti, but she's very understanding my practice and respects it 100%. With all that in mind, 
Does this make me a bad devotee? Does this mean I don't have a place in the Hare Krishna movement? I feel discouraged when I hear lectures from devotees who are very strict in their approach, in their approach, and it doesn't even seem attainable sometimes, but the love of Krishna is felt so deep in my heart that sometimes it brings me to tears when I can't. Please excuse me for any offenses. You guys help. Thank you, and Hare Krishna. What a nice, sweet, sincere guy this is. Kevin <laughs> okay. Shanahan. Shan, I mean, Kevin so, Shanahan. Thank Rogan you for off. writing that. Yeah, so there was a lot of major Soup? lag the entire time you were reading that. Yeah. Um, so I'll just summarize. I'll try to summarize. That... Um, Kevin was saying that um, he started getting serious about this practice during COVID, and now that some COVID things have lightened up, he's been able to go to temple. But when he's there, there are different kind of teachers, and some of them are more stern and strict and orthodox, and some of them are a little bit more, I don't know, friendly, I guess, <laughs> or, um, or, you know, easier, you know, to deal with. And he's wondering, you know, my lifestyle, it's not the strictest in the world. I, I do follow a lot of the practices, but, you know, there are others that I don't necessarily follow strictly. Um, does this make me bad? And, you know, I'm getting a little discouraged sometimes. How to make sense of all of this, basically. Um, okay. So I think this phenomenon that Kevin's speaking about is just super common in any kind of religious slash spiritual kind of communities, right? You're going to get different people that, that present it in different ways. Now, we read a quote, you know, it was, it was a couple of weeks ago, uh, Raghunath read, it was a quote from Bhakti Vinod Thakur. It was really in the context of how one dresses, but it had a broader application where he said, when there's too much focus on the external, generally our focus on the internal suffers, right? And, and, um, I think that that can happen amongst different kind of teachers or different kind of speakers or just community members, you know, that um, especially when we come in early, it's kind of like, oh, there are these rules. These rules make sense. If you're following the rules, you're advanced at this. And if in any way you're not following the rules, you're, you're insincere. And if I'm going to speak up on that, that's going to help you. I'm going to just put it right in your face because you need to hear this. And you're insincere because you're not following right, like me, right? So that's like, a, it's kind of a very beginner, superficial kind of level of approach, you know? And it's okay. Um, you know, um, as we grow a little bit in our spiritual life, if we're sensitive and we're, we're aware, we, we'll become better judges of who's actually deep and who's kind of like superficial in their practice and in their teachings um and, and so at a certain point one may say you know these people they're talking about they're kind of you know this person's and i'll tell you something quite frankly that i've seen like within the the institution that i've been raised i've seen a lot of times speakers dwell on negative stuff right like criticizing everybody that's not as spiritual as them and quite frankly it does nothing for me it doesn't inspire me at all. It's, I, it just kind of like, I immediately just get turned off. I'm just like, I don't need to hear this, you know? Um, so there'll be a lot of that kind of talk. And what, what Kevin says is that it, it makes him feel, I think he said discouraged, I think was the word that he used. And this is important, that um, you need to find association. You need to hear from people that make you feel encouraged and not discouraged. Uh what a lot of speakers don't realize is that when you have to help, along with recognizing, we need to be aware of our weaknesses, but we can't become obsessed with them because if we become obsessed with them, we just become disheartened and we become weaker still. You know, like, well, I can never do that. And then you just like stop practicing altogether, right? So our weaknesses, we need to be aware of them and a good speaker will help us be aware of them, but at the same time, focusing on our strengths helping us understand where we're strong and encouraging us where we're strong. And if we get encouragement, and so you were saying, you know, Kevin was saying where he's strong, you know, I, he's getting up early in the morning, he's doing all these practices, you know, he's with a, he's, you know, he's got a partner and she's nice and she appreciates what she's done. All these are like, these are strengths. Let's focus on them. Let's be aware of what the weaknesses are. 
but let's not obsess about them. And if you get a speaker that's just like kind of obsessing about the weaknesses, it can be discouraging. And and you so that's one, you know, that's the first thing. Find that association that encourages you, that when you hear it, you feel alive, and I want to all the more I want to commit myself. And if there are other speakers that when you walk away from them, you feel discouraged. Well, then, you know, you can respectfully ease away from that association, you know, with, and then now this becomes important without becoming judgmental of them, without becoming resentful of them. You know, as you go deeper yourself, you're going to become a better judge of who's deep. But if you resent those who aren't deep, then that can be a poison in your whole thing too, right? That can be like a wrench in the whole system. But as you grow still more, you know, when one grows more, we let go of those resentments and we begin, we begin to appreciate others, even with their flaws. Uh, and so, you know, that's, that's really, that's how I would encourage you to try to think that, um, those speakers that kind of turn you off and discourage you, uh, you don't need to, they don't need to be your guys, you know, they don't need to be the sources of your spiritual inspiration, but, and, and so try to be respectful of them, but without, um, you know, but maybe they're, but they're not like the people that you need for your spiritual life. Um, don't resent them. Don't criticize them. Just like, you know, be nice to them and be respectful to them, but find you, find what you need from where you're getting it and take it from there. That, that in general, that's the way that I would approach it. You know, the, 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 it's hard because people live in different places and they can meet, you know, maybe in their town or something like that in their city they're not finding people that really understand them or really are approach, approaching them with in a deeper way that can really inspire them. So that's tough. The good news is all this internet stuff, it's, it's really helpful for that. Like there's a lot of great stuff out there that you can, that you can find, uh, messages that encourage you. So look for that. Be respectful to the others. Don't be discouraged. You know, again, don't become obsessed with your own weak um, areas. Focus on your strengths. And uh, that way you won't feel disheartened, you won't feel alienated, um, and you'll step by step, you'll keep moving forward. All right? Ooh. I think we're beautiful. Okay, you're back. Okay, Robert, there he is. I'm back. Right. We're done? All right. That's it. Thanks, everybody. Ah, oh, questions and answers day. So there's going to be no class tomorrow and no class on Monday, and then we'll see you Tuesday for Stuba's special birthday. What do you think about that? <laughs> I don't think we should do it. I think it'll be too late. It's cool. Too late. Sorry. <laughs> You're getting a birthday party. I'm going to spank you. Come here. Yeah, you can come here. Amelini's here. I also want to announce. Oh, I'm, I'm announcing. That's my to birthday gift the right there. Just seeing Amelini. <laughs> November 3rd through the 16th, I'm taking a gang to India for pilgrimage. If you're interested, write ragu.pilgrimage at gmail.com. I didn't even announce it yet. But if you contact Tar, my assistant, they'll get you get a discount for all Wisdom of the Sages people. Thanks, everybody, for joining us, and I'm looking forward to seeing you. And thanks to this Wisdom of the Sages retreat, people. And I'm looking forward to seeing everybody soon. Everybody have a safe flight back. Let us dance.